if you ever trapped with aura or wearable, that's usually the one of the main takeaways that people have is the how bad alcohol is on your sleep. And it really does just destroy your sleep ar architecture, the quality of your sleep. Welcome back to another episode of the Peak Performance Life Podcast. Today, I am very excited to be speaking with one of the premier experts in a field that everyone is realizing now is becoming, is maybe the most important aspect of health. So we're here today with Dr. Dan Gartenberg, aka Dr. Snooze, founder of Sleep Space. He's also an adjunct assistant professor at Penn State and have a PhD in applied psychology. And he's been doing sleep research for over 15 years and learning about how the sleep, how, you know, sleep we all know has plays a role in memory, cognition, almost every chronic health disease. And so Dr. Gartenberg has decided to really focus his efforts on this. And really over the past few years, I think the timing couldn't have been better. He's, he's been ahead of the game. He's been doing this for 15 years. But, you know, as many of you have realized in the last few years, there's really been so much research and study comes out uh, about sleep. Um, I've heard this phrase one time that I really like a lot, which is goes something like sleep basically controls sleep is the boss of you. That's what it was. Sleep is the boss of you. So when you have bad sleep, you're not going to be functioning at your best. We all know that. So Dr. Gartenberg, thank you so much for joining us here today. And I'm really excited to, to get into all the research you've been doing over the past 15 years. Me too. I'm, I'm pumped to be here. And, you know, almost everyone can relate to wanting to get more out of their sleep. And I hope to give your audience all of the recent tools and uh, hacks and solutions to get there. Amazing. Amazing. Well, let's start with kind of like what, uh, how did you originally get into studying sleep and, and then maybe transitioning into some of the things you've been, some of the research you've been doing over the years? With sleep? Sure. I mean, I, I started with my own personal struggles, actually. So in high school, I think I, I, su I likely suffered from something called delayed sleep phase syndrome, which has to do with when your circadian rhythm gets, uh, is unregulated and um, desynchronized and having to do with going to bed late on the weekends and waking up too early on the weekdays. And this essentially caused insomnia that I struggled with throughout college. And during that time, I was really interested in how the brain works. And I saw sleep is actually the key to unlocking the full potential of the brain and the body. And I was taking some neuroscience, neurobiology of sleep courses, and that's what really solidified my interest. And, you know, the U.S. healthcare system is really focused on this illness model of health and sleep is one of the main tools we use for rejuvenating, recovering our, our you know, from uh, the day and is how we can promote a more wellness system in healthcare. And that's what I'm passionate about. And I'm driven to figure out new ways of using technology to improve every human sleep when often over the past hundred years, technology has probably done just the opposite of that. But I think there is a way to finally use the tech to promote good sleep. Amazing, amazing, yeah, and I, I'm sure we're all interested in in the tech as well. I'm sure we'll we'll get to that as well. Um, you know, one one thing I just remembered, one quick stat I remember hearing, and I don't know the exact stat, so I'm going to butcher it a little bit. But the point of it was something like people who work night shifts um, have you know a, a, a very a disproportionately high much more higher risk of getting diseases, of having all sorts of other problems uh, as well, right? And so I think that's just one example of, of kind of like how we've seen where lack of sleep or messing up your circadian rhythm or, or different things like that. Um, so yeah, we, we know how important it is then. So yeah, let's get a little bit about, let's, let's give a little bit of background on the research. So kind of kind of going back 15 years ago, you know, over the last 15 years, what are some of the things that you, how, how have you studied uh, sleep and what are some of the things you've learned? Sure. Yeah. And just to bring up your point before the uh, World Health Organization actually recently said that shift work is carcinogenic. That's how bad it is. And it's, uh, 
you know, actually a really harmful thing to, to your, your brain. My, what I've been interested in largely in my research has been how sleep relates to Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. So there's mm-hmm. a lot of recent evidence showing that um, sleep and deep sleep in particular plays an important role in cleaning out these beta amyloid plaques um, that are thought to be associated with conversion to Alzheimer's disease and mild cognitive impairment, which is going to be the biggest cost to the healthcare system in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. So trying to improve people's sleep and their deep sleep in particular could be a way to reduce that public health problem of dementia that's going to be really bad when all the baby boomers, the biggest generation, starts getting older. But sleep really impacts every chronic health disease. Sleep apnea in particular, uh, where you stop breathing throughout the night, has been strong to, shown to have really profound impacts on the cardiovascular system, hypertension. You know, mm-hmm. Poor sleep is related to increased likelihood of getting cancer. And there's both correlational evidence for all these things and also causal evidence because we sleep for a reason. We spend a third of our lives doing this for a reason. And there's actually probably about six reasons why we sleep, which I can get into. And my research started out at first studying how Air Force pilots actually get fatigued and people who are in the military who operate supervisory control vehicles. And the study, this is known as the study of vigilance, which is actually the ability to sustain attention over prolonged periods of time. And, you know, about $400 billion a year are thought to be um, cost into due to accidents from poor sleeping and fatigue. So that's what I initially started studying. And I was making artificial intelligence models of how fatigue works in humans for the U.S. Air Force and the Naval Research Labs. And then a professor from Harvard approached me about this new effect in the literature where essentially zapping the brain with electricity timed at the right moment could increase these delta waves and how a new way of doing it that's less invasive involving sound could actually be used to improve these delta waves that are thought to, you know, glymphatic drainage is, is what happened. This system for cleaning out the waste that happens in our brain. You can feel free to look up glymphatic drainage. And so that's what I've been studying is ways of increasing deep sleep with sound, light, and temperature. And particularly we're running a clinical trial right now on using new Internet of Things devices to address insomnia in older people and show that our system can reduce conversion to mild cognitive impairment. Wow. Wow. That sounds really cool. Uh, Especially, I mean, wow. So, yeah, I saw that you were working on um, something where literally noise, uh, uh, I guess it's kind of like, kind of looks like an alarm clock uh, kind of a thing, right? And then it makes noises. Um, at certain times, you know, throughout the, throughout the night, would that be at certain times in your sleep cycle? Is that right? Yeah. So we're one of the only apps, maybe the only app that measures sleep during sleep. So a lot of the other, you know, alarm clock apps or trackers, they'll measure the sleep after the fact, but we're doing it while you're sleeping in order to adjust what we call a smart sound machine. So every 30 seconds we'll adjust sound based on your sleep stage in order to try to improve your sleep quality. Wow, wow, that's really interesting. I I know, you know, I've tested a lot of things with sleep personally. um, And uh, I did wear an aura ring for a while. I stopped wearing it because I started uh, every morning running to check my score. And then if I had a bad score, I was kind of mess up my head. But but I did wear it for a while. And I tested a lot of different things that I wanted to test. Um, And and the one thing that, that made a noticeable impact was actually having a white noise machine. Um, so it's interesting how noise is like that. And I don't know if that's just because it's, you know, drowning out, you know, the, the motorcycle that's at three in the morning driving exactly. by, you know, and, and knocking people out of their deep sleep without them even realizing it, or, or if it has something to, to do with the sound, I never really thought about that. 
Yeah, so I think there's a couple factors. And in our lab, you know, we'll hook people up to polysomnography, which is basically a montage of electrodes that act, that's the gold standard in measuring sleep. And you would be surprised that even something like an air conditioning turning on will wake up the sleeping brain. And if you wake up, right. if you have these brief arousals, you know, a minute, two minutes, you're not going to remember your amnesic to those short events. So one way to improve your sleep quality is to more effectively uh, mask those noises. And we do it with a smart sound machine. So we'll actually increase the volume of the sound machine slightly when we detect that you're asleep in order to more effectively block out those noises. But I think there also is sort of a, what we call in sleep science stimulus control. So when we have these multimodal associations, i.e. pink noise or white noise, I like pink noise, uh, and that's and we have a couple brown noise things in the app. There's different types of noise for that are nicer on the human ear. So that is one of the best ways to create an association with, okay, this sound is playing, now it's time for sleep. So I think there might be two things going on. And then the third thing that we're doing, which is novel, is playing this delta wave when we detect that you're in a deeper stage of sleep to uh, try to enhance your, your deep sleep brain waves. That sounds super cool. And definitely, you know, with the white noise machine, there are some times where I turn it on and it's like, it's a little too loud. Like I want it to be louder because I want it to drown out more sounds, but it, it does can, can get a little bit hard for me to fall asleep sometimes if it's too loud. So I end up turning it down sometimes. So, so this sounds like a great solution because then I could maybe, I could, it could be a little bit lower volume. And then once I fall asleep, then it turns exactly. up the volume, drowns out the noises, inserts other things during the right times of my sleep cycle. Sounds awesome. Exactly. And, and playing the sound precisely is really important. So that's why we also have this little uh, optional mechanism. It's like a phone charger. So the phone is in the same place every night because the phone is the sound machine in my, in my tech. So right. this way the phone is always in the same place. And, you know, there's something called sleep spindles, which probably has to do with how sensitive you are to noises. And some people have more of these and some have less. And that basically dictates how sensitive you are. We recommend if it's waking you up, like distracting, to turn it down a little bit probably is mm -hmm. best. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I want to definitely get into the tech and, and all that. I want you to explain it thoroughly and how people can 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 try it out. But before we do that, I do want to ask, um, I'm sure a lot of people listening now um, want to know about just practical things that are maybe ruining their sleep. So maybe what are the biggest sleep, you know, based on your studies, what are the things that really ruin people's sleep, specifically deep sleep as well, the most? And what are what are some basics, um, you know, stuff that that doesn't involve maybe any tech that that are best practices for sleep? Yeah. So, you know, the way I like to think about it is first and foremost, rule out an underlying problem. And I'll just preface this by saying it's not medical advice. I'm not a medical doctor and see your doctor about any anything that I'm about to say right now. But you know, one of the most common sleep problems, and it's going to face literally one in two adults by 2030, is sleep apnea. So uh, it has to do with obesity and an aging population. But basically, throughout the night, and I'm actually recently, I gained some weight recently, personally, over COVID, which I think is pretty common. And I was able to even detect as it's a little embarrassing, but as a sleep scientist that I am also suffering from this problem to some degree. And I'm getting formally diagnosed um, through uh, this collaboration we have with Wesper, um, this other company um, in a in next week, actually. But I, I likely am not breathing well throughout the night. And that puts a lot of pressure uh, on your heart, essentially. It's related to hypertension. So the first step that I usually have is ruling out some kind of underlying issue. And sometimes actually when you have sleep apnea, it can lead to lighter sleep, which leads to other problems like possibly insomnia. They can go together a lot of times. But that's the big underlying issue. But there are other ones too. Uh, probably the second most common 
underlying issue is restless leg syndrome. And, um, you know, that there's actually a recent uh, technology that's non-pharmacological for addressing that uh, called Notrix Health. Um, that uh, hmm. is an interesting new company. So basically, and an, a, a neurologist can can diagnose some of those issues, um, and a pulmonologist also. Um, and our medical system is sort of there's other solutions for something like sleep apnea than people realize. While the CPAP is the gold standard recommendation, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. things like uh, certain tailor made mouth plates called uh, mandibular advancement. De- ad- uh, devices are can be useful for mild to moderate cases, and there's other behavioral interventions like weight loss, not drinking alcohol, um, even exercises. That there's a couple of randomized clinical trials showing that certain throat exercises, because it's a physical thing where your muscles are basically weaker, uh, can help to some degree. So those are all the things that we're we're sort of interested in. But my main focus has been on insomnia. And the sad thing about our healthcare system is that while the recommended treatment for insomnia is cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, which involves addressing maladaptive thoughts um, and uh, addressing feelings and behaviors that form around sleep, that's, you know, Non-pharmacological interventions are the recommended treatment for insomnia, but unfortunately, oftentimes drugs are the first line of defense. And there's, you know, a place for the drugs, but usually they're more short term and not necessarily addressing some of the underlying issues that's really causing the problem. And I'm all about what is causing this and fixing what is causing that. And that's the best way to address certain problems and sometimes other things um, like a drug. And there's definitely a place for the drugs in certain situations, especially. Um, But sometimes that can be more of a Band-Aid. And for example, things like melatonin are really meant for short-term use. Um, And melatonin is one of the, you know, less, uh, it's not going to help hinder your sleep quality like some of these other non-benzo benzos uh, and other things other sorts of pharmacological yeah what, what is your opinion on melatonin then in terms of because i know it's you know a lot of people talk about it has lots of antioxidant benefits potentially immune system benefits um, i personally don't take it uh, i don't like taking anything that could be habit forming or I, I don't think i necessarily need it but um but there are a lot of people who take melatonin right it's a very very popular product what do you, have you seen people who take melatonin has you seen it affect their deep sleep in one way or another or overall what's your kind of what's your what's your uh, i think on? the science shows that it's more around your ability to fall asleep and it's not actually making you tired it's more giving you a signal that now it's time for sleep so and it's operating on the same system as what sunlight operates on so it's probably bit more effective for certain people than other people. I like to also use like a happy lamp, which is a way of getting the same sort of effect. You know, getting sunlight during the day is giving a similar cue to your body as taking a small dose of melatonin at night. Um, right. There are, are, I also usually don't like to do things. It's not habit forming really at all. Okay, um, good. But there's no there's no addictive aspect to it. But so you you don't have a problem with people using melatonin. I, I actually love getting sunlight first thing in the morning. So maybe that's why I don't need it because I, I pretty much every morning I'm doing getting sunlight first thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, but yeah, there there are yeah. I mean, and that's a good little hack. Is I I I I I tell my wife all the time, no sunglasses. So right. just to make sure that my eyes are getting the sunlight and. Andrew Uberman, the pod, famous podcaster, always says, "Like, look sort of towards the sun when I, you go I, I outside." Do, I do look. Um, at, I do kind of have my face facing facing the sun. I, I mean, you know, I'm not going to stare yeah. right into the sun, obviously, but don't or, stare at the early sun. in the morning. It's, exactly, it, it works well. Well, what's the no? I mean, melatonin work? is it's proven for like uh, air travel. Definitely, it's relevant. Shift work <laughs> definitely useful. Um, maybe, uh, people take really high, too high dosage sometimes, maybe a, maybe a regular supplement of 300 micrograms, which is wow. very small dose 
A lot yeah, of times, sometimes they'll I've take seen ten. I've seen ten. Uh, a lot of times, it's like ten milligrams. Yeah, yeah, um, ten milligrams. That's but which I've seen as low as two milligrams on some supplements, and I've seen yeah. ten milligrams on some supplements. Usually, the literature shows one to three milligrams being efficacious, but uh-huh. and sometimes the supplements also don't have the amount that they claim to have, which is another issue. Mm. Um, but yeah, maybe 300 micrograms isn't going to like mess with your hormones. If you start taking too much, I think there's some evidence that your body sort of becomes relying on it in a negative way. Okay. So that's good. Yeah. So kind of looking, looking at the dosage on it, seeing if you really need it, but, but looking at the dosage, getting some early sunlight could be another hack to, to, to also not have to take melatonin. And, uh, I, I do find that, that, it, that it does work well for me, um, in terms of getting the early sunlight. You also mentioned real quick in passing something like a happy, a happy lamp or something. What was it? Yeah. So like if it's like a dreary day out in New York City or, or I'm at or, you know, if you're living in a place like Portland, Oregon or something like this, you don't get the sun or it's like dreary all the time. You don't go outside. COVID made us like indoor creatures, which was particularly problematic to our circadian rhythms. Mm-hmm. But I have it, you know, right here on my desk. It's just a really, really bright lamp. So 10,000 lux. Um, huh. And it won't be quite as good as, you know natural sunlight nature is sort of one of the keys to healthy sleep and i think we're partly sleeping worse than we ever have as a society because of our disconnected nature being disconnected from nature but something like this can sort of um give you you know some benefit that like the, which the sun would provide so happy lamp so people can buy that like on amazon or something happy yeah lamp. Uh, the one i use is verilux basically you want anything more than ten thousand lux of light can okay. have the effect on your eye and it's used for um sad seasonal um affective uh yes depression um interesting that's wow. typically that's what cool. it's used i never heard for. of that that's yeah. very cool. I could be really useful for people who I'm in Vegas, so I'm uh, I'm, I'm pretty lucky. It's sunny right. pretty much all year round, every day, uh, and barely ever rains. But uh, but yeah, for for people in New York and, and other similar climates, uh, I would definitely get one of those if I was in one of those climates for sure. Yeah, and the other part of it is the blue light at night, which is also bad. Mm-hmm. So we have a setup, and my software integrates with these things called LifeX bulbs. So nice. we'll have a wind down and these are smart light bulbs. They'll, they can fit in any fixture. And so it's connected to Wi-Fi. My software integrates with it. So like I'll do like, okay, now it's time to wind down and all the lights in my home will turn red. And that's yeah. there's photoreceptors in the eye where blue light in particular is bad at night because mm-hmm. um, it sends the wrong cue at the at the sense a cue at the wrong time essentially like it's it's an alerting cue so we mitigate that with red light at night and the the photoreceptors in your eyes are less sensitive to that in and in, in producing um in inhibiting melatonin basically interesting really interesting so th- what are those smart bulbs called again l-i-f-x L-I-F-X. Okay, smart yeah. bulbs. And then those can, can start turning red at night. Uh, I wear also blue light blocking glasses um, Same, you know, every sim- night for years. Yeah, similar sort of things. I, I like um, blue light blocking is good. The, the ones that are like red, I think uh, yep. Dave Asprey has like a true dark, uh, the, yep. the day, the night, it's called like Nightwalker or something like that. Yep. Uh, yep. That it's a similar sort of thing, but instead of having to wear something, it's like my whole house is just red. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And that that's useful for me. I have you know I have kids. My daughters aren't going to wear the blue light locking glasses at night, and maybe to get them to wind down. Uh, I don't know if they'll let me exactly. turn their room red either, but we'll we'll get. I, I actually just got one for my six year old uh, nephew, so I think he's using it. I told him to use the red light at night um, nice, to help him nice. sleep. Yeah. And just just kind of wrapping up uh, the the sleep apnea thing because I know it's such a big thing. So it so that obviously it becomes more likely as you gain weight, huh? So people who so people who would be let's say overweight or obese um, might have a, a fairly high likelihood of developing 
uh, sleep apnea. Do you know what any kind of percentages oh, yeah. around like what percentage currently of people have sleep apnea or, or if you're overweight, you're more likely or? Oh yeah. So it's a really strong linkage with, with weight. You don't have, that being said, you don't have to be overweight to have this. You can be mm-hmm. perfectly healthy and also have sleep apnea. It's definitely possible. Um, right. I'm, you know, personally, I'm probably like 25 pounds overweight and I didn't have it before. And over COVID, when I gained that 25 pounds, I, I got it. And, you know, you can see me, I'm not like, you, you wouldn't look right. at me and think I'm like very much overweight. I'm definitely a little overweight. Um, but that's just an example of how, you know, just a small change in weight can actually have a pretty big impact on the, on this disease. Yeah. Um, so to answer yeah, your question. Too, yeah, alcohol too. One thing I'll just mention also the worst sleep score I ever got was on New Year's, uh, New Year's mm-hmm. Eve, uh, a few years back when I when we had a, a little party at our house, and uh, mm-hmm. and then I checked the sleep score the next morning and it was like red alert, like the numbers were literally the worst ever. So um, clearly, alcohol is 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 one thing that we all know is really really bad for for sleep there as well. Yeah, and if you ever tracked with Aura or wearable, that's usually the one of the main takeaways that people have is mm-hmm. the, how bad alcohol is on your sleep. And it really does just destroy your sleep gar- architecture, the quality of your sleep. Yeah, yeah. I've heard of some people then, like, obviously, cutting out alcohol altogether would be the ideal solution. Um, but, uh, but, you know, maybe some, not everyone is going to do that. So for those who are going to drink, maybe having one earlier in the day rather than later in the day, do you think that would help a little bit? If you drink a lot, sometimes if you have like insomnia, you drink a lot and you think that that's helping you, but it's sort of just knocking you out and it's really hindering your sleep quality. So sometimes you drink and you perceive that it's helping, but it's actually hurting. So that's something to be really aware of. You know, if you also like, if it's a really sweet drink, you know, some drinks are really have a lot of sugar in them. Mm -hmm. So that's why usually if you are to drink, probably the best way to do it is with one of the lower sugar beverages, perhaps tequila is arguably the best. And I usually will not do more than one or two, you know, that being said, I'm a little bit older nowadays, back in my twenties, that definitely wasn't the case. And yeah. I understand that people like to drink and socialize, but just be aware that it is having this this impact on you. Yeah, and it's an important point that you made about like, yeah, people might say, oh, well, alcohol helps me wind down and go to sleep. It's like, well, it helps put you to sleep, but if you actually measured your deep sleep and, and, and REM sleep, which you know I think are the two most important ones, you'd be seeing that it's actually really hurting your, your sleep score. So that's a good distinction um, to make there. Uh, I, I have to ask you, what are your thoughts on mouth taping, right? For people, wh- whether or not they have sleep apnea or not, you know, there's a lot of talk. There's a whole, there's a book by James Nestor called Breathe, which was like a 400, 500 page book. And basically yeah, the, I've, the short, the short version of it is breathe through your nose, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what yeah. do you think about that? I mean, it's definitely healthier to breathe through your nose. That mm-hmm. being said, um, you know, use mouth taping to like treat sleep apnea is not, I don't think there's much evidence to show that, you know, that's like an effective treatment. It might help a little bit to some degree and for some cases, but you should breathe through your nose. Yeah, it's, it's definitely better. I I've tried some of the mouth tape. Um, I don't know. I like to like drink water at night personally, and I found it a little bit weird for that, but Mm -hmm. you know, you should, people, People don't know how to breathe, really. It's funny, like the education system in this country doesn't really teach people things like how to breathe or how to walk the right way, which I wish I learned myself in kindergarten. And a lot of times we have to reteach ourselves these things. So when, when I have kids, I'm going to try to really you know, emphasize how to breathe and doing it through your nose Um but yeah, there, the, the, there's definitely some truth to it. If you are really stuffed up in your nose, though, or you have a deviated septum, maybe that isn't the best thing. So that's mm-hmm. why a lot of the stuff is very, you really have to know where you're at, what's going on with you, and understand some things might work for one person and not some other things might work for another person better. Right, right. Good point. 
Good point. Um, let's circle back now to, to your tech, to your, to your technology. How does it work? What, what is it exactly? Uh, I know you have an app, right? Um, a smartphone app, but, but how does, tell us a little bit about, uh, how the tech works. Yeah. So it's called sleep space. I've been working on it for a long time. It's a smart alarm clock. So it'll wake you up in a gradually in a lighter stage of sleep, but it also has what we call a sleep journey which are structured sounds for falling asleep, staying asleep and, and waking up without morning brain fog. So we'll have like ocean waves play that fall, flows into a pink noise machine that dynamically adjusts, plays the delta wave, and then wakes you up with 528 hertz or even a gratitude meditation. And that's sort of the right way to wake up is gradually. Nice. Without that, you know, alarm big cortisol burst in the morning. You have a natural, it's called a cort uh, cortisol awakening response and um, that happens when you wake up, but you really don't want to get flooded with that stress hormone from an alarm clock. Uh, so that's why we have this smart alarm clock. And then we'll also connect with all the wearables. So we'll connect with the Aura Ring, we'll connect with Whoop. Um, and then we have various meditations that you can do. Uh, I like gratitude meditations, progressive muscle relaxation, body scan. We have some sleep stories in there. So kind of meeting you. Everyone should have a relaxed, should be able to reliably um, slow their heart rate. And then on top of that, we have sleep programs based on things like cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. So if you're having problems falling asleep and staying, it's not a treatment uh, in any way, but if you're having problems falling asleep and staying asleep, I've worked with one of the leading um, behavioral sleep medicine experts, Dr. Daniel Taylor, creating this program, which is a six week course based on uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, teaching you those things to help you fall asleep and stay asleep. Nice, nice. Yeah, that sounds uh, that sounds super cool. I'd love to wake up to a uh, gratitude meditation. Uh, that that's the way to wake up, man. That that's the right, that's the way to start your day. Um, versus like, uh, just like just just the sound of that like alarm clock waking you up. Uh, and I don't use an alarm, you know, unless I'm traveling and I have to be up for an event or something at a specific time or wake up really early. Uh, I, I hate using an alarm uh, to wake up. I, I really cannot stand it. Um, and I noticed the other thing that's weird, because I rarely use an alarm clock on the days that I do, like I recently had to wake up at, you know, 4 a.m. or something for to catch some early flight. And I find that I keep waking up and, and oh, being yeah. like, did the alarm go off? Did I miss right. it? What's going on? Like, and it's just like, it totally messes up my sleep. Like it actually like, I don't know yeah. what it is about it. So I... Now I have a little, that I have another thing. little bit of an issue is that I, I tend to wake up with the little, once a little bit of sunlight starts coming, peeking through the window. Uh, and I even have, you know, the regular shutters and then I have another curtain that goes over it, but even still a little creep of sunlight that creeps through that, that thing in the morning. And I just wake up from that. So it's kind of like my, my natural alarm clock. Um, mm -hmm. so I have to make sure that I go to sleep on time every, every night. Cause I know that when the sun comes up, I'm going to wake up, but, uh, but yeah. No, yeah, you, you're touching on a lot of things there that, that are definitely true. Um, you know, one of the best hacks that I've personally had for sleep is a blackout blind in the morning because that light really is a strong cue to wake up. And I totally agree with you that ideally you'd wake up without an alarm clock. You know, waking up naturally probably is the best, but that's just not an option for many people. And this gets into how society plays a role in our sleep and there's something called social jet lag, which has to do with, say, a night owl, someone who naturally likes to go to bed wait, late, um, having to wake up at a certain time for work. And they call that social jet lag, where, where society is sort of giving you this jet lag feeling because of the external demands that it places on us. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, makes a lot. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I know I, I know I'm waking up at a certain time. So I know if I don't go to bed at this time, I'm, uh, I'm gonna be tired the next day because I'm probably waking up. So the blackout curtains, 
uh, are they are uh, do you have a brand of those that you actually recommend because again i have shutters and then i have like curtains yeah. on top of them but i'm not sure i think they were black out but they're they're white color so i don't i don't know exactly is there a best yeah, one yeah it actually there was one on shark tank recently i can't remember the name but if you google sh- blackout blind shark tank okay. uh, cuz some of them can be really expensive and i've actually struggled with getting the you have to measure your window in new york right. city like all the windows are different so I actually had to, I struggled a little bit to get it to work. Uh, and so I think there's this company that uh, sort of solved that problem to some degree. It's one of these Shark Tank Shark Tank products. blackout curtains. I'm going to check yeah. that out uh, yeah. right after this for sure. And uh, I think, you know, it, it is kind of annoying because it's like, I'm not really a handyman in my house either. So like putting these mm. things up and this and that, exactly. I'm probably just going to call the call my handyman or whatever to come put it up. But but yeah, it's, it's, it's like a little bit of a, of a, you know, it's a little effort you have to put in, but I think, you know, setting up your sleep space, right? No pun intended right. is really, uh, really important to take the time and the effort to, to do that. Once you do it once you're, you know, you're talking about the most valuable part of your health and you're like, like you said, you're sleeping a third of your life. So really important to take the time and, and make the sleep, your, your sleep space, your sleep situation, the best possible. So, so yeah, love that. So those are, those are good tips there. So basically then you have, so right now, um, at sleep space, what's the best way for people to kind of like find you and, and try it out. And then it, 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 so it comes with a smartphone app and the alarm clock. Is that basically the two things you have? Yeah. Well, the app is the alarm. So the app is an alarm clock and okay. I'm offering a special, uh, 30 day free trial to all your users. If they just go to sleepspace.com slash union. U-N-I-O-N, and anyone can just try it out for free for 30 days. You don't like it, then no skin off your back. You you don't have to pay anything after, you know. But if you like it after 30 days, then it's pretty affordable as well. So we really just want people using this thing, improving their sleep. And um, I also have a little phone charger that goes with it, but it's just an optional thing, just so we can play the sounds more precisely on your side of the bed. So that's the whole device right there. What you just showed me, it's like that little hook that goes on your bed somewhere. And then you're, it's a, it's also yeah. a, a phone charger. So your phone can charge in there while it's yeah. hooked onto the bed. Uh, so can your phone be in airplane mode when you, when you, yeah. Do so it? that's something that a lot of the people who liked our system, they are like, are call themselves biohackers. Yep. And some of them are very concerned about EMFs basically. Mm -hmm. And I'm sort of, I think it could be an issue. I think there's also maybe other things that could be bigger, play a bigger role too. I'm sort of like, I can be convinced either way, basically. But that being said, I designed this to make sure that it can work completely offline. Because I know many Great. people are are concerned about that, so yeah, yeah. it can I'm work. I'm one of those in, biohackers who, who yeah, has a, you're one of those people. So who has a yeah. uh, EMF testing device right here on my desk? Uh, oh really? Uh, yeah, actually, I have one too. So I, I I've tested a lot, so I understand like what causes a problem and what doesn't. Yeah, um, yeah. And so we made it out of metal, so it will reflect the EMF too if you don't put your phone in airplane mode, um, but. You know, it'll also totally work in airplane mode, and then there's definitely not an issue. Nice. So you basically you um, you get this you get this thing. It hooks onto the side of your bed nice and easily. It's also a charger. You can have your phone on airplane mode, and then basically that will that app from your phone will then start playing um, the different whatever whatever program I guess you set. I guess you have a couple of different programs people can choose from. Exactly. Yep. Nice. Nice. Awesome. And then, um, yeah, are there, are there any, you've seen, obviously I know you guys are doing clinical, clinical studies right now, right? Have you, have you, do you have any kind of preliminary results or anything you can share from people you've? Yeah. So I have one published, first off, I have one published paper showing that playing these deep sleep stimulation sounds can increase these regenerative Delta waves. And that's published in nature and science of sleep. I have another paper published in the journal Sleep, which is the preeminent journal in the field, uh, showing the accuracy of how our algorithm is one of the most accurate. And I'm about to unblind my uh, clinical trial. It's been going on for almost three years now, so I'm really excited to see the results. And that's on a group of people who have insomnia who are 60 plus years old. And we're trying to show that 
um, when the recommended treatment for insomnia is a six-week program of cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia with a trained clinician who's trained in this treatment of cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. The problem is there's not enough of these people that are trained. I think like, for example, there's only one person trained in this in the state of Louisiana. Uh, so it's, there's not enough people for the problem. So I'm creating tech to try to augment the clinician. So we're going to try to show that when the clinician uses these internet of things, devices with sound and light um, and meditations and um, inf you know information about cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, that, th that it's more effective and it's easier for them to implement than when they don't use our technology. And we are, I did see that overall people, we definitely are treating their insomnia and that that's related to improvements in these cognitive assessments associated with mild cognitive impairment. I just don't know if it was due to my system yet. And I find that out in like a week. Amazing. Well, I mean, you know, great job doing, putting in, putting in the actual work for years, right. To do this right. And, and do real studies on it. Right. Not just, you know, there's so many things these days where people just pop up with something new and, you know, a week later they're making claims about it, you know, without much testing or studies or anything. So real testament to you for, for putting in the work and, uh, on this, on this very important topic here. Um, and then people could, I guess if people wear an aura ring, like many, I people, many people I know do, they could, they could see for themselves, right. The difference, uh, in, in the scores if they're wearing one. Right. So, yeah. yeah and, and we'll integrate with aura. We have like a wrapper for aura. So we'll take your aura data and then analyze it based on your unique sleep needs. So it's mm -hmm. like enhancing your aura and you can see if it improves your, the, the quality of your sleep. And I'm going to try to make it more structured so you can actually, see that more easily. Um, but yeah, I think this is the future of sleep where you're running these little experiments on yourself, showing how the black outlines make sense, how the red yes. light makes sense, how the pink noise makes sense. And exactly. the way I like to think about it is there is, and I, you hit the nail on the head before where how the cool thing about sleep is you make one change in your environment and then that third of your life is is improved forever. It's not like having to continually exercise or, you know, these are like long lasting changes to your health that you can make with simple adjustments to your environment. And that that's what I think is so amazing about improve, the potential for improving people's sleep. And I like to think there's one thing that anyone in your audience can do tonight that's unique to them that's going to improve their sleep quality. And think about what that might be for you and what it might be for you might be totally different for someone else. And just one of the quintessential examples of this is for, is like, if you're an optimizer, maybe it's good to take a power nap, but if you're someone who has issues falling asleep and staying asleep, you should never nap. So this is just one example of how it's very specific mm -hmm. to what you're dealing with. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's really good. And people, people really need to pay attention to this, you know, and, and not neglect this. It's like, like you said, one little change, right? People can make one little change using your device, using your device, testing things and seeing different, you know, white noises, pink noises, uh, waking up to a gratitude meditation instead of an alarm clock, you know, wearing blue light -like blocking glasses or having blackout curtains, one little thing, one little thing, if but most, you know, again, most people, hopefully not people who listen to this podcast, but most other people will, you know, probably not do anything. They'll probably not take any action. But if you're listening to this podcast right now, seriously, take action on this because one little change can literally improve your quality of life for the rest of your life. For some people, that could be 50, 60, 70 years of a higher quality life just by changing one or two things and measuring your sleep and seeing the improvement in your sleep. It's really, really phenomenal. So many people I know in the business world, entrepreneurial world as well, complain about lack of energy or lack of motivation. Imagine Imagine if they got an hour more of deep sleep every night or and more REM sleep every night, right? Like how, how could that impact their, their energy levels, their, their mental capabilities? So I just think this is so important and uh, really want to thank you, Dr. Gartenberg, for coming on the podcast and sharing your wisdom. And I think you said sleepspace.com forward slash union, right? U-N-I-O-N. That's right. 
That's right. Perfect. So that gets people a 30 day free trial on it. And uh, yeah, I highly recommend everyone give it a shot. I'm going to give it a shot here as well. So um, yeah, really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for, for coming on here today. Oh, thank you. It was a great talking with you. I hope we can do it again. Absolutely. Thank you. Talk soon. Thanks for listening. And just a reminder, if you haven't yet tried any of our Peak Performance products, you get 20% off your first order. We have one of the largest selection of USDA certified organic superfood powders, as well as very high quality supplements. And you get 20% off your first order at buypeakperformance.com. That's www.buypeakperformance.com.